Let's take a journey back in time to Burlington, North Carolina over its first 100 years. The town, originally known as Company Shops, was the midpoint of the rail line between Charlotte and Goldsboro. The North Carolina Railroad found the location most advantageous for providing support in the form of maintenance and repairs for the trains. Inside the train station, now called the Historic Depot, is a mural covering all four walls painted by artist Rodney Moser. I had to find images and put them together from different sources. Uh, we were using um, the paper, we were using the libraries, we were using any type of publication that might have something of that uh, period. It depicts many significant events that occurred in the city during its first century of existence. A lot of the photographs that had that were in the paper, if you'll if you see the the actual photograph and compare it to the mural, you'll see that I've switched out some of the people. Just use the image itself and the setting uh, to portray some of the local events in our history. Across from the historic depot is the old roundhouse, the oldest building still standing on the North Carolina Railroad line. Originally built in the mid 1850s, the building had deteriorated over the decades. The old roundhouse was renovated in 2003, using old blueprints of the original building. Now known as Company Shop Station, it reopened as a public train station with the Whistle Stop Museum in its lobby. In 1886, the North Carolina Railroad moved its shops, eventually settling in Spencer, North Carolina. One year later, Company Shops took on its new name of Burlington. There are several stories of how Burlington got its name, but a favorite involves a roaming bull from Vermont. A man in the country purchased the bull, bringing it from Burlington, Vermont by train. Once settled in its new home, the Burlington bull was kept in a pen for a while, but often escaped and roamed the streets. The story goes that someone suggested the city be named for the bull, Burlington. After company shops relocated, Virginia Bridge and Ironworks moved into the empty railroad buildings and produced steel for bridges throughout the nation. A previous company shop's worker, Reverend Spencer Thomas, opened a metal shop, which was well known in this area throughout the 19th century. And the Broad Street School was the training center for the troops of F Company. They were sent off to fight in the Spanish-American War in 1898. But by the time they reached Raleigh, the war had ended. In 1902, automobiles came to Burlington. One of the first was an electric car owned by Mrs. John Q. Gant. She had an electric car. She did not like the uh, combustion of the noise from an uh, internal combustion engine. So she was always going down the street and you couldn't hear her. And she, the story was that she liked to sneak up on people and then blow her horn and scare them. Well, uh, during her period behind the wheel, she actually hit three people. Well, I was telling my grandfather this story as I was painting that, that image, and he started chuckling, and he said, I was one of the kids that she hit. The Railroad Hotel was one of the town's earliest landmarks. The two-story building with traditional Victorian wraparound porches housed a famous restaurant along the rail line. Thomas Edison and Henry Ford are said to have been guests there. Passengers would wire ahead for reservations at dinner, and it stayed in operation even after the railroad company left until 1904. May 24th, to be exact, a disgruntled employee went back one night, spread kerosene on the floor of the kitchen, and burned it. And the railroad hotel was gone. The first decade of the 20th century saw rapid growth in the textile industry in Burlington. Aurora Mill was one of the many textile plants operating in the city during the time. A common sight for this period was a mother and daughter working side by side for very little money at one of the area mills. Alamance General Hospital, originally known as Dr. Rainey Parker's Hospital, was the county's first major medical facility. In 1911, streetcars came to Burlington, officially linking the town with Haw River and Graham. For the first time, people were able to live in one community and work in another. The Piedmont Railway and Electric Company operated into the 1920s. 
At the end of the First World War, on Memorial Day 1919, the town honored its troops. A replica of the Arc de Triomphe was erected across Main Street, and the town threw a huge parade. In 1912, President Theodore Roosevelt spoke from the rear of a train at the depot during his presidential campaign. It is, are the American people fit to govern themselves, to rule themselves, to control themselves? In 1918, the city had one of its biggest fires when its business block burned. And it was a huge fire. In fact, they called Greensboro to bring an engine to help fight the fire, brought it by railroad. I think the the railroad had an accident up about Glen Raven and the car rolled off the train. But at any rate, we had the fire and uh, destroyed most of that block down to Pete Neese's jewelry store. But uh, the fire was eventually put out. The block was restored, put back in business, and it wasn't long before Main Street was Main Street again. Around the same time, there was a push to extend Main Street across the railroad tracks in an effort to promote growth but an empty railroad building blocked this project. Early one morning, the building exploded. Rumor persisted that members of the city's governing body were responsible. Moving into the 1920s, the Heritage Brothers Circus was formed in Burlington and toured throughout the Southeast. During this period, a residential community on the west side of Burlington was built and named Fountain Place. The fountain still stands today as part of the Burlington Historical District. Have you ever dug for buried treasure? Legend says that Confederate gold may have been buried somewhere along the railroad tracks. They uncovered one of the uh, pots of gold that had been melted down into a smelting pot and was found at the intersection of Webb Avenue and Spring Street along the sides of the railroad. The, the gentleman that dug it up disappeared the very next day, which I thought he was probably a smart man to do. But they've apparently never found the Confederate gold that was buried. Uh, so, you know, that, that would have been a little boy's dream when he was growing up here. Hungry? Burlington residents frequented the Alamance Hot Wiener Lunch, now known as Zach's, a true Burlington institution. The Paramount Theater and the Atlantic Bank and Trust Company, also known as Burlington's Landmark Tower, both built in the 1920s, are still standing today. Saxophone player Les Brown and his band of renown headlined many dances, which were held in the Standard Building on North Main Street and over stores on Davis Street in the late 1920s and 30s. In the 1930s, labor strife divided Burlington. Labor organizers had been trying to unionize the Burlington Mills plant. At one point, the National Guard were called in to patrol the area around the mill to control the violence. Despite the efforts of the organizers, the union vote failed. There were other major crimes in the 1930s. One occurred at the Ossipee Mill when machine gun toting gangsters robbed it of its payroll. The Sprinkle gas station was the site of the city's most infamous crime. In 1938, December 7th, in fact, Alamance County had a new sheriff. Sheriff Robertson, a former Burlington police officer, had just been installed two days before. And this night, he came by the Burlington Police Department to visit his old buddies. And while there, a call came in for a, a robbery in progress at the Sprinkle gas station just north of the underpass on what is now Church Street. Uh, he responded to that call with the officers and he and an officer, Sonny Vaughn, went through the front door and were gunned down on the spot. They died right there. Officer Bailiff went through the back window at the same time and killed one of the bandits. Then he went for help. Um, the other bandits escaped. They were sought over North Carolina and Virginia. They were finally brought to justice, sent to prison, and uh, so ended one of the most memorable murder cases in Burlington's history. Did you know that boxing matches used to be held in City Hall? And that when a new post office was built, the original became May Memorial Library? And the small Burlington company, Barnwell Brothers Trucking Company, grew to become Associated Transport, one of the major freight carriers in the nation. 
Mill villages were another integral part of Burlington's history. Many of the homes built around the textile mills are still owned by the hard-working families who struggled through the Great Depression and made the best of what they had. Though the 1930s were an economically challenging time for Burlington citizens, baseball, soon to be known as the nation's pastime, was gaining popularity locally. Almost every mill in the area had its own semi-pro team. Rivalries were heated, and mills would often lure top players from other teams, adding to the intensity of the games. In the 1940s, the Burlington Bees were popular in the Carolina League, winning the pennant in 1947. Ted Williams was in service at the Chapel Hill Navy Pre-Flight School. A team from the school came to Burlington twice in the 1940s and played local semi-pro players at Hillcrest Park. Major leaguers Johnny Sane and Johnny Pesky also played in these games. Legend has it that Williams hit one of the longest home runs ever in that park. But history tells a different story. Unfortunately, Williams had several hits, but no home runs. In World War II, a lot of the Major League Baseball players went to war. And uh, some of them wound up in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, at the University of North Carolina, in a pre-flight program. They were training to be aviators. And they formed a baseball team there. And you had players like Ted Williams, Johnny Sane, Johnny Pesky, um, Bobby Doerr. And they'd all been in the Major Leagues just before. Ted Williams had just hit 406 the season before. And uh, they formed a team called the Cloud Busters. And they played semi-pro teams around Central North Carolina, and they came to Burlington twice. After those two games, they went back to Chapel Hill and played their season out and went to war. And then after the war, they went back to the majors and made more baseball history. Earl Horner was first elected as mayor of the city in 1918. He served Burlington for 27 years until his death in 1945. The old rayon uh, plant on North Church Street had been vacant since 1932. The government immediately took the building over and brought Fairchild Aircraft in from Hagerstown, Maryland to produce a training plane. The Fairchild AT-21, made entirely of plywood, was an airplane made in Burlington at the rayon plant building. The Fairchild was a training plane built during World War II. First plane flew from there in 1943. They built approximately 43 planes, and then the military went to four engine bombers. Our plane was obsolete. So they closed that operation and brought in uh, Firestone to build military artillery pieces until the end of the war. The day the war ended, the plant closed. The war was over, and that plant was out of business again, but not for long. Western Electric was soon to come. Western Electric Company took over the plant after the war and remained a major industry into the 1980s. The start of World War II in 1941 saw movie stars being recruited to sell bonds in support of the war. Stars including Jane Wyman, Lucille Ball, and Lon Chaney Jr., otherwise known as the Wolfman, visited the city. They spoke in tobacco warehouses to huge crowds, it turned out. Just selling bonds, uh, speaking to individuals that came out to see them. And it was their way of helping the war effort. And Burlington performed very well, providing a lot of money for war bonds in the region. Like many cities across the nation, Burlington had a USO for servicemen located on Davis Street. In parades during the war, local soldiers marched past City Drug and the Rayless Building. In August of 1945, people from all over the city poured into downtown to celebrate the end of World War II. Dr. J. F. Gunn was a respected black education pioneer in the community. Because of his work, J. F. Gunn Elementary School, now demolished, was named in his honor. May Hosiery Smokestack was a local landmark. At the end of the war, the company known as May, McEwen and Kaiser brought models to Main Street to put on nylon hosiery again. Nylon had been to war and finally it was back where it belonged, on women's legs. 
As we move into the 1950s, we enter the era of the beauty pageant. In 1951, 1954, and 1957, Burlington was home to the Miss North Carolina pageant. It was the largest state pageant in the nation at the time. The contestants were in Main Street parades and on the Kiwanis Special, the train at City Park. In 1951, we had a very active junior chamber of commerce in Burlington. It was composed of young guys who were World War II veterans who had come home and wanted to make a difference in Burlington to put this city on the map. And one of the things they did was to convince the Miss America pageant that we could put on a preliminary pageant in Burlington, Miss North Carolina. In the past, it had always been in a coastal town, Wilmington, Moorhead City, but it came here in 1951. In the 1950s, Burlington's new City Lake, which later became Lake Kamek, opened and ensured an ample water supply for the future. In 1951, Alamance County Hospital opened on the east side of the city. Segregation was still a way of life in the 1950s, and there were two high schools in Burlington. Walter Williams was the school for white students. Jordan Sellers was the school for black students. A portion of Jordan Sellers still stands today. It has been renamed Sellers Gunn Education Center in honor of Dr. J.F. Gunn and Jordan Sellers, who was a supporter of Negro education from the North, from whom land for the school was purchased. The annual Halloween Spectacular attracted thousands from the South to come see the spectacular firework display. Speaking of attracting thousands, Elvis Presley gave a performance in the town of Burlington. But many asked Elvis who when he performed at Walter Williams High School Auditorium in 1956. He came to the Alamance Hotel to stay overnight but found what it cost and couldn't afford it so he went up to the old Piedmont Hotel. His name was Elvis Presley. Elvis could have later bought the hotel, of course. But he put on his show and uh, then moved on to Winston-Salem for his next event, and along the way stopped at Brightwood Inn up on Highway 70 for a hamburger. That booth is still there with his picture, a portrait over that booth, and people continually go in and ask to sit in the Elvis booth today. Teenagers danced away the after-school hours at the Teenage Club. It was, for this generation, the beginning of rock and roll. It was also the beginning of the Rotary Boys Choir, directed by Miss Eva Wiseman. She and her choir boys would later travel the world. The choir continues today as the Burlington Boys Choir. Hopalong Cassidy led the Burlington Christmas Parade in the 1950s. At the time, he was the spokesman for Melville Dairy's ice cream. The Alamance County Arts Association was born during this period and moved into one of the historic Holt homes on East Davis Street. In 1960, the United States elected its youngest president, John F. Kennedy. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Nationally, the Cuban Missile Crisis was escalating. Cuba was a threat to the safety of the United States. Locally, Western Electric was building components for missiles, which were designed to destroy incoming enemy missiles in the event of an attack. Sadly, JFK was assassinated November 22, 1963, as famed news anchorman Walter Cronkite announced to the country. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. It was a Friday afternoon in November of 1963. I was working the copy desk at the Times News, in other words, laying out the front page. And um, at that time, our press time was 2 o'clock. We ran at 2 p.m. Our paper was ready. I was waiting for it to run so I could check it and was doing absolutely nothing until my phone rang. It was our circulation manager who was home for lunch and he was watching a soap opera. He called and said, what's this I hear about the president being shot? And I asked him, what kind of a soap opera are you watching? But at that time, the bells on the AP machine started ringing and sure enough, there was the, the flash. President Kennedy had been shot in Dallas, Texas. Immediately, we remade the paper. We didn't start running had a headline that said, the president is shot. We started with a very small story behind that headline, 
And then uh, more came, we stopped and added to the story. And then I made another headline. I said, the president is dead. We made that page, we wrote our story actually from what we thought was happening so that we'd have it ready when that word came. And sure enough, it came, the president is dead. We remade it, we put it on the press and ran it. And um, that was one of the saddest days I ever worked at the newspaper. Also during this decade, Burlington saw many changes. Most notably, state ABC stores began selling alcohol in Burlington, and the golden arches of McDonald's brought fast food to town. The city saw many openings, with Cum Park Plaza expanding many shopping opportunities, Alamance Memorial Hospital, and the opening of the city's new municipal building downtown. The dual lane Highway 70, south of the city, became Interstate 85. The 1960s were marked by turbulence, as racial violence flared in the period of school integration. There were several nights of violence on Rawhut Street, with one death resulting. The National Guard was called in to restore order. There was some controversy about that being on the mural, and the city was always really great about letting me have the final say in what made the mural, mural and what didn't. Uh, after the unveiling of that wall, uh, I got a call from a, a woman in the community who t told me who she was and said that she thanked me for, for displaying that in the history of Burlington, that it was her son that had been killed, and she was glad to know that the people of Burlington had not forgotten that, which was very touching. Uh, rather than it being something that they were, the city was ashamed of, it was something that the, someone that close to this person was, was thanking us for portraying. In 1969, Holly Hill Mall was constructed. And everyone watched on television as Neil Armstrong became the first man to walk on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Columbia, Columbia, this is Houston and AOS, over. The 1970s were difficult for many. The decade brought gasoline shortages and long lines at area gas stations. Many of Burlington's young men went off to fight in Vietnam. some of whom would not return. And the unemployment rate jumped to 20%. The textile industry was particularly hard hit by the recession. Downtown Burlington went under the wrecking ball in a redevelopment program. Many old buildings were removed and the Burlington Historical Depot was moved from its location by the tracks and turned to face Main Street. In 1970, Cummings High School, with its mascot, the Cavalier, opened in East Burlington. Alex Haley came to town in the early 1970s to do research for his book, Roots, one of the most influential literary works in our nation's history. Haley discovered important pieces of information at the Murray Plantation in the Crossroads Church area, and later, some of the television miniseries was filmed there. Parking meters were removed from Burlington streets, much to the relief of many. And Paul Hard Rock Simpson, a Burlington postman, consistently made news with his long distance running. Early in his career, Simpson twice participated in races across the U.S. He was featured in Ripley's Believe It or Not, for a feat accomplished in the 1920s. He was put in a race with a horse from Burlington to Moorhead City. He won when the horse dropped dead near Goldsboro. 
He was a local guy. He grew up here. He was a track star for the local high school. And in the 1920s, he actually ran two marathons. I don't mean 26 miles. He ran from Los Angeles to New York. The next year from New York to Los Angeles. He didn't win, but he was close. In later years, Simpson celebrated his birthday by running a mile for each year of his age, often running in athletic competitions. In the 1980s, coach Jerome Evans made news and was featured in a book when he was named football coach at Walter Williams High School. He was one of the first black high school coaches at a predominantly white school in the South. Williams won several state football titles in the 1980s. The Elon College Fighting Christians, now known as the Elon University Phoenix, also played at Williams Stadium and won two consecutive national championships. Hot air balloons became part of the area's attractions with the beginning of the Alamance Balloon Festival. Donna Oliver, a teacher at Cummings High, was named National Teacher of the Year and was honored by then-President Ronald Reagan. I actually had to talk my way into that office, but I got there, I made the photograph which is on the wall behind me. And on April 21st, 1987, we went to the Oval Office at the White House where President Reagan presented her the National Teacher of the Year Award. And Burlington had a national winner for the first time. Burlington's historic carousel was restored and turned into a major attraction at City Park. It is one of the very few Denzel carousels in the nation, a real jewel. The Carousel Festival remains an annual fall event. Neighboring universities, UNC Chapel Hill and North Carolina State won national basketball titles during the 1980s, much to the pleasure of local fans. Professional baseball made its return to the city with the Burlington Indians, and our stadium was updated as their home. An international company, Roach Biomedical Laboratories, became part of the community when it purchased Dr. James Powell's Biomedical Reference Laboratories, now known as LabCorp. Around that same time, we were introduced to the era of recycling. Cummings High School won its first of many state football championships. Another sport, soccer, gained popularity as players and fans filled our parks. Because these sports attracted so many local fans, Joe Davidson Park was built in recognition of Burlington's former Recreation and Parks Director. In the 1990s, Duke University fans celebrated national basketball titles. Burlington also built a new water reservoir, Lake McIntosh, honoring city manager J.D. McIntosh. Alamance Regional Medical Center opened in 1995, combining Alamance County and Alamance Memorial Hospitals. Burlington resident Blanche Taylor Moore was sent to death row in 1990 after being convicted of murder. She was convicted of killing her boyfriend with arsenic and other deaths in her family were investigated. The case made national news and Moore became known as the Black Widow. President George Bush came to town in 1992. He stopped across the street at the Railroad Roundhouse building and spoke to a huge crowd, just as Teddy Roosevelt had done many years before. We are going to lift this country up, make life better for every single worker, and restore total hope to these young people here today. May God bless the United States. George Bush was a colorful campaign stop. All the banners, the Secret Service, the whole by uh, nine yards. It was a big day in politics in Burlington's history. But we are honored, Mr. President, to host this historic Whistle Stop Tour, just like it is. And now we arrive at the final panel of the mural which features scenes from the Centennial Gala held at the depot on May 1st, 1993. 
The building and grounds were ornately decorated for the affair, transforming downtown into something as magical and spellbinding as Disneyland. What a wonderful and memorable event it was. Also depicted on this panel are members of the Centennial Celebration Committee and the creator of this masterpiece, Rodney Moser. This mural is truly a community treasure, which everyone who lives in and visits Burlington should see. It is a work of art to which few other cities can lay claim. Burlington has undergone considerable change in its first century of existence. From the sound of steam engines, to the bull, from which some say it got its name, to the modern and progressive city it has become, residents of Burlington, North Carolina can revel proudly in its past and look forward with anticipation to a bright future.